My favorite Allen School event is the job talk of a Compile faculty candidate who can help us learn about new problems, new important biomedical problems that computer scientists can address. It's always really exciting to see what's out there. So today, it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker. Sheng Wang is a postdoctoral researcher in the School of Medicine at Stanford University and a, a Chen Zuckerberg Biohub Scholar. Prior to that, he obtained his PhD in computer science from UIUC in 2018 and his bachelor's degree in computer science from Peking University in 2013. Um, Sheng's research uses machine learning and natural language processing to address both fundamental questions in biology and translational sciences as well, which directly is directly relevant to disease treatment. And today he's going to talk about his recent um, research focus on predicting and understanding never before seen situations in biomedicine. So this research has resulted in not only publications in prestigious biological journals, but also real world, many real world impacts in biology, medicine, and healthcare, and is used by major biomedical institutions. So uh, before we have Shen talk, I'd like to briefly remind you about a few things. So first, um, please mute your microphones, which I think everyone did it. And then uh, please enable your webcams as well. And then um, second, the Q&A needs to be initiated via the chat feature. So please type hand or question there. Uh, and then I'm going to interrupt um, Sheng uh, if it's during the talk. And then the, finally, our new question asking policy, which is that we welcome only quick clarification questions during the talk and the other questions that need to be asked at the end of the talk. So, okay, now, um, please uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Sheng Wang. Okay, thank you for the introduction and uh, please let me know if you can hear me clearly, okay? I'm very excited to speak at Paul Allen School of Computer Science and Engineering. Today, I'm going to talk about a very important problem in modern biomedicine. The goal of modern biomedicine is essentially to address a computational problem. That is how to transform complicated and large scale data sets into knowledge. Machine learning can do a very good job if we have enough training data. But what if we don't have enough training data? Or in the extreme case where we don't have any training data? For example, predicting side effects of a new drug or classifying patients to a new disease like COVID-19. I named this kind of problem never before seen biomedicine. It is a label class, like a disease or a drug, and we have never seen any training samples belonging to these classes. For example, here we have five training patient samples who are classified into two different diseases. We also have three other diseases, SARS, MERS, COVID-19, and we have never seen any training samples belonging to these three diseases. They are the never before seen classes and they are the focus of my talk. We will see some test samples in the future and they might belong to any of these five diseases. So now the question we want to ask is, how can we classify a test sample into a never before seen class? This problem setting is similar to generalized zero shot learning but I'm going to talk about specific challenges in biomedicine later. Well, let's also talk about the solution later. Let's first look at what kind of biomedical problems involve never before seen classes. In fact, this patient disease classification problem is just a tip of the iceberg. There are many other important problems that involve never before seen class. For example, we still don't know the mechanism of many new diseases and rare diseases. That is because we have only seen very few patients of these diseases. Side effect of a new drug is another ex example. Drug side effect is the major reason why many new drugs are taken off the market. We cannot predict side effects of new drug because we have seen we have, not, we have never seen any patients taking these new drugs. 
except those very few in the clinical trial. Problems caused by never before seen causes are pervasive, especially in big data age. We are often collecting and integrating data from different species. So when we do such a joint analysis of all these data sets, we will inevitably see lots of never before seen classes. And if we are studying new drug, new disease, and new cohort, we also need to consider lots of never before seen classes. So now you can see that there are so many problems caused by never before seen classes. These problems seem to be very different and they are currently tackled by different biologists. But I believe that addressing the never before seen challenge might be the key and a general solution to all these problems. So just like how deep learning has become a general solution for lots of problems where we have enough training samples, we want to find another general computational solution for biomedical problems with no training samples. Let's go back to this example again to see three specific computational challenges here. Because we have never seen any training samples for these never before seen classes, we need to have some extra information. What we often have are class attributes. So in this patient disease classification problem, class attributes could be symptoms. Although we have never seen patients belonging to these never before seen diseases in this data set, other sources or other data set might have seen such patients and have provided us with class attributes. But why don't we just simply use class attributes to classify patients? This is because these class attributes could be very noisy, especially for never before seen classes. If we only diagnose based on these class attributes, we could make a very significant number of misdiagnoses. For example, at the beginning of COVID-19 outbreak in December, the first few patients are misdiagnosed as SARS. So the first challenge here is to develop representation learning method that can obtain high quality class representation. Okay, now let's assume we have addressed this challenge and we have high quality class representation. The second problem is how to do the classification. The problem setting is that we have training sample for some classes and we have class representation for all classes. How can we use these class representation to transfer labels from seen classes to classes we have never seen before? Okay, let's assume again we have addressed this classification problem and now we can accurately classify a test sample into a never before seen class. The third challenge is how to interpret our results. Interpretation is very important in biomedicine and interpreting never before seen classes is even more challenging and more important because our knowledge about these classes is very limited. Do we have a good class attribution or do we have a good, good interpretation for COVID-19? We don't, but we really need one. All of my previous research focused on addressing these three challenges in never before seen biomedicine. For example, one contribution I have made is to develop representation learning method to embed different biomedical structures into class embeddings. Using this class embedding, I have addressed important prediction problems in biomedicine, such as protein function prediction and cell type prediction. Then I developed an interpretable model to interpret this prediction. Model interpretation is one of the most important problems in biomedicine. We integrate scientific papers and biological databases to build a knowledge graph for interpretation. I know that UW has the leaders in this field, such as Professor Suying Li and Professor Dan Wild. They have developed many exciting methods like SHARP, Tree Expander, LIMAD. Our method is highly complementary to these approaches. They found the interpretation from the data set itself, but we found the interpretation 
from external knowledge box. So these three, these three steps together build up a very exciting framework from no labels to new knowledge. And it also provides us a general computational solution to different biomedical problems. Our methods have real world impact in biomedicine. They are building blocks for many important biomedical applications. We then collaborate with different biologists and fine tune our method for their tasks according to the specific problem settings. This results in a very fruitful collaborations. For example, our representation method help doctors at the Mayo Clinic find the mechanism of more than 400 cancer drugs. Our classification method for never before seen cell types help 36 biologists in Chen Zuckerberg Biohub accelerate their annotation pipeline from three months to 20 minutes. We are also currently trying to find the rare disease genetic factors for California newborn screen program. Our interpretation method and the knowledge graph also help hundreds of scientists at NIH understand their biological discovery. Today, I'm going to talk about all these three parts, representation, classification, and interpretation in never before seen biomedicine. Let's start from the first part. The reason why we need to do representation is essentially to help classification. Then why is classifying samples into never before seen classes difficult? Let's look at an example here. These gray ones are test samples and the remaining ones are training samples. Here is the gold standard. Green and the purple are never before seen classes. So samples belonging to these classes only show up in test samples and have never been seen in training samples. If a sample belongs to a never before seen class, we want to classify it to the specific class. So if a sample should be green, but we classify it as purple, this prediction is still incorrect. Here is the prediction of K nearest neighbor. You can see that K nearest neighbor incorrectly predicts the classes of any samples belong to a never before seen class. This is not just a problem for KNN. In fact, any machine learning method cannot make correct prediction here by only using these features. Then how can we solve this problem? The solution to this problem is zero-shot learning. Zero-shot learning can classify samples into never-before-seen classes if we have class attributes for these classes. Zero-shot learning has been used to, used to classify images into never-before-seen image classes. It is relatively easy to collect class attributes for image classes. This is because these image classes are often classes that we humans are familiar with, like animals or fruits. So we can often find high quality class attributes somewhere. It is less likely that we are interested in classifying image even humans don't know. Like, like maybe classifying image into alien from Mars or alien from Jupiter. But in biomedicine, the story is totally different. In most cases, we simply don't have any class attributes. So this is a very interesting dilemma in biomedicine. Zero shot learning has good performance when we have class attributes. But these classes are often old knowledge and less interesting. However, for new knowledge, which is more interesting, zero shot learning cannot do well because we don't have any class attributes. Do we have class attributes for COVID-19? And the biomedicine is all about discovery in new diseases, new drugs, and new cohorts. So how can we solve this problem? Our contribution is to use the biological class hierarchy to help us. A class hierarchy is a structured data that biologists use to document their knowledge. In biology, we call them ontology. 
you can think that you, you can think of it as a 2D binary adjacency matrix. Each node is a biomedical concept. Each edge connects related biomedical concepts. And even using this hierarchy is challenging. This hierarchy is high dimensional. There could be more than 20,000 nodes. It is also incomplete and noisy. The curation process could introduce many missing or incorrect edges. So we don't have class attributes, and all we have are these high dimensional, noisy, and incomplete class hierarchies. Now, the question is how can we convert them into high quality class representations? Here is the problem definition for this question. The input is the hierarchy. The output is an embedding vector for each class in this hierarchy. So one prerequisite of our method is that these never before seen classes must present in the class hierarchy. The goal here is to represent each node in this class hierarchy as a low dimensional vector so that topologically similar nodes are embedded closely together in the low dimensional space. Well, now the question is, which two nodes are topologically similar given this hierarchy? One key observation is that this hierarchy does not follow six degree of separation. So two leaf nodes on a hierarchy could have a much larger distance than six degree. So we need to explicitly model the global structure. We use high order proximity to calculate topological similarity here. High order proximity can capture global structure. It is different from low order proximity like first order or second order proximity. They only capture the local structure. For example, here for this hierarchy, we want to know which node is similar to this red node. If we use first order proximity, then two nodes are similar if they are direct neighbors. For example, this blue dash circle is similar to the red node. But in this case, we only utilize very limited information on the hierarchy. That is only the direct neighbors. So how about we use the second order proximity? Second order proximity means that two nodes are similar if they share many neighboring nodes. For example, this blue dash circle is similar to this red node using second order proximity because one of their neighbors is the same. So now you can see that for each node, second order proximity utilizes a bit more information on the graph, not only direct neighbors, but also neighbors' neighbors. Then why don't we just use an nth order proximity? Here, n is the number of nodes on the graph. In this way, we can capture the whole graph structure. Because class hierarchy could be incomplete and noisy, we want to capture the global structure to mitigate the noise. The noise. Using the nth order proximity, any two nodes are similar if their distance to all other nodes are similar. Let's look at the math to see how we implement high order proximity. The goal here is to calculate a similarity score between every two nodes on this hierarchy. Here we use a diffusion model called random work with restart to calculate the similarity score. In each iteration, we will either randomly work to a neighbor or restart from the original node. After the diffusion is converged, we will get the equilibrium distribution starting from each node. And this equilibrium distribution models the distance from this node to all other nodes on the hierarchy. So in this way, two nodes are topologically similar if their equilibrium distribution on this graph is similar. However, these distributions are still high dimensional. We need to reduce their dimensionality. What we can do is to jointly decompose the equilibrium distribution of all nodes. We want to find an embedding vector x and a context vector u for each node so that the observed s is close to the estimate s hat. And this xi will be the class embedding for class i. 
our representation can be used in both supervised learning and unsupervised learning. I'm going to talk more about the application in supervised learning later when I finish the classification part. Here, let's look at an application of our method in the unsupervised setting. The goal here is to cluster cancer patients into different groups so that we can find a personalized cancer treatment for each group. We use our method to embed 6,000 cancer patients for can patient survival clustering. Each data point here is a cancer type with about hundreds of real patients. So this figure shows that our method is much better than the one without using high order proximity. This figure shows that our method is much better than the one without doing dimensionality reduction. And these results together show that our embeddings enable personalized cancer treatment by accurately clustering patients into different groups. We also have a few follow-up papers extending our method so that it can be applied broadly to different problem settings. I'm going to briefly introduce three extensions. First, if we have multiple hierarchies, for example, Drug hierarchy created based on different criteria. One could be based on drug chemical structure similarity. Uh, another one could be based on drug target similarity or based on drug side effect similarity. How can we integrate them into one hierarchy? The key idea here is to decompose every hierarchy as we did before. And let this node embedding XI be shared across different hierarchy. So XI, represents the embedding of node i by integrating different hierarchies. Now our method can be used to integrate information from accumulating and diverse biological hierarchies. What should we do if the hierarchy has multiple node types and multiple edge types? For example, a hierarchy can have not only drugs, but also diseases and genes. How can we embed all of these nodes. We introduce additional parameters to model different edge types. And because now the hierarchy could be very large, when it has multiple edge types and node types, we sample edges according to the frequency of different path types. So in each iteration, we first sample a path, and then we sample a specific path according to this path type. This method enables us to incorporate the data set from other sources into biological hierarchies. And then we can jointly analyze all of them. So what should we do if we don't have any hierarchies? This time, we need to build new hierarchies. We jointly mine scientific literature and biological data, data sets. We first build a gene cluster hierarchy for the specific problem we want to study. For example, in our major communications paper, we built a class hierarchy to model tumor evolution. We then mine biomedical phrases from literature and align each gene cluster with a phrase. So in this way, we can have a new class hierarchy for follow-up predictions. And this method enables us to update, correct, and build hierarchies. Our hierarchy-based method can then be broadly applied to other biomedical applications. So this is the first part of my talk. We use class hierarchy to generate class embeddings for never before seen classes. Our representation has two key steps. First, we use equilibrium distribution to model global structure. Second, we reduce the dimensionality of these equilibrium distributions. Next, I'm going to talk about the second part. How can we use these class embeddings to classify samples into a never before seen classes? This is the problem setting of the never before seen classification problem. The first input is samples. The second input is the class embeddings we got from the representation step. The goal is to classify test samples, and many of them might belong to a never before seen class, like green ones and these purple ones. So in the training stage, 
we want to find a transformation to protect samples from the sample embedding space to the class embedding space. The, optimiz the optimization goal here is to map training samples as close as possible to their class in the class embedding space. For example, in this case, you can see that the optimal, the optimal transformations like rotate a little bit and squeeze in this dimension so that the orange samples are close to the orange classes. Pink samples are close to the pink class, blue ones are close to the blue class. During the test stage, we use the same transformation to project test samples. And test sample will be classified into the closest, into the nearest class in the class embedding space. So this one will be classified into orange, this one will be classified to pink. And the key of our method are these samples in the green region. They are classified into the green classes. And we have never seen any green samples in the training data. Let's look at the implementation. So during the training stage, we want to find W, then minimize the cross entropy loss. And during the test stage, we use the same transformation to classify each sample into the closest class. So generalized zero, zero, zero shot learning could be easily overfitted and biased to thin classes. In the extreme case, all test samples might be classified into thin classes. So we often use a linear regression, linear transformation in the training stage. We also did a calibration after the test stage to normalize prediction scope between seen classes and never before seen classes. Our method has been applied to a few important biomedical applications, such as protein function prediction, single cell prediction, and patient disease prediction. Next, I will talk about two applications. Let's start from the single cell. So what is a single cell? City. So our human body is consists of 20, 27 trillion of cells. And cell type is the building type, like a restaurant, a school, or a grocery store. The goal here is to classify cells into cell types. And we have only seen about 5% of cell types in the training data. This is one of the most important problems in biomedicine now. Why? because we detect diseases by counting different types of single cell. This is, this is a complete blood count test, which is often the first test you will get if you feel sick. In this table, three rows are the counts of three different cell types, white blood cell, red blood cell, and platelet cell. And the five other rows are different properties of cells. So from this widely used CBC test, you can see how single cell can be used to detect diseases. In 2018, there is a very exciting technology breakthrough called the single cell technology. With single cell technology, we can measure features for individual cells. And these features are the gene activity score. In biology, we call them gene expression. Single cell technology let us see the feature of every single cell, just like here in a fruit ball. Rather than seeing the averaging feature of many cells in a big organ or tissue, like here in a smoothie. If we don't study the cells individually, we will not be able to tell which part of the organ is sick, or we may not even know that it is sick. Because we can see every individual cell now, we will see lots of never before seen cell types. Then predicting cell types is an emerging problem. Let's look at the experimental setting of our method. There are two inputs. The first is the gene activity feature scores of 500,000 cells. It is a 20,000 long numerical vector. The second is the hierarchy of cell types. There are two, more than 2,000 cell types but only 98 of them are seen in the training data. We can now use our method to classify these cells. First, let's look at the cell type prediction performance. 
x-axis is how many never before seen cell types are there in the test set. A larger x-axis means that there are more never before seen cell types. Pink one is our method. We can see that our method outperforms all the baselines. For example, even when 80% of the test data is from a never before seen class, our AUIOC is still greater than 0.7. The key observation is that the improvement of our method is larger with the increase of never before seen classes. By embedding cell type hierarchy, our method first ever enables the classification of cells into never before seen classes. This kind of never before seen classification often cannot be achieved by human experts. We then study the generalization ability of our method. This is very important in biomedicine when we want to integrate and jointly analyze multiple data sets. So we collect 27 data sets. We train on one data set and then predict on the, on the other 26 data sets. You can see that our method has a very strong generalization ability. For those cell types we saw in the training data, the AOIOC is greater than 0 0.95. Even for seven cell types we have never seen in the training data, we still had an AUIOC greater than 0 0.8 for four of them. Because we can accurately classify cells into cell types now, we can also do some post-processing to find data-driven class attributes. These novel data-driven class attributes are exactly the knowledge that human experts don't know but really want to know. We also observe good performance here. Our method, the red one, is comparable to expert-curated attributes in classifying new cells. My research in single cell analysis has been extensively used by major biomedical institutes, Chen Sackberg Biohub. Biohub is a joint, joint collaborative effort from more than 100 labs in Berkeley, UCF, UCSF, and Stanford, funded by 600 million commitment from Chen Sackberg Foundation. Single cell is one of the two main projects in Chen Sackberg Biohub. They are producing some of the existing largest single cell data sets in the world. And our method is used to predict the cell types in their pipeline. We are now applying our method to rare disease detection. We are currently working with scientists who advise the California New Bone Screen Program. So any new discovery of our method might potentially impact every newborn in California in the future. And this is also the ultimate goal of my career, that is to help millions of patients and their families. Now let's look at the second application, how to predict protein function. Human bodies consist of single cells and a single cell consists, consists of millions of proteins. If you think single cell as a building, then proteins are bricks, windows, carpets, in this building. And the protein function will be the property of these bricks and windows, such as fireproof, thunderproof, or waterproof. The goal here is to classify each protein into its functions. And the challenge here is that most of the functions have very few training samples. For example, in human, about 50% of functions has less than 10 training samples. So this is a few short learning problem now. Why is protein important? From this CBC result, you might notice that eight of them are related to single cells. And the last one is actually an indicator of protein. So we also detect diseases by, monitor, by monitoring proteins. Let's see the experimental setting. There are two inputs. The first input is the feature representation of proteins. The second input is the hierarchy of protein functions. We can now use our method to classify these proteins. Let me first introduce how to represent proteins from different species. To get the feature embedding for each protein, we integrate proteins from different species. There are two types of edges. One is edges connecting protein across species. 
based on sequence similarity. The other is edge connect protein within the same species using molecular networks. So this kind of large scale network let us embed proteins from different species into the same low dimensional space. So later we can transfer biomedical experiment results such as drug effectiveness, drug side effects from other pro other species to human. And this process creates a very unique heterogeneous network data set, including more than 60,000 nodes and more than 200,000 labels. Here are the results of our method. The x-axis represents classes in different categories based on how many training samples are there for each class. The blue one is our method. We can see a significant improvement in comparison to other approaches, especially for those functions with very few training samples. The improvement of our method comes from using the hierarchy to classify proteins into function with very few training samples. In addition to these exciting results, our method has been used by NIH Big Data Technology Center and the Mayo Clinic. Our method in this pipeline is an important building block for cancer research conducted by doctors in Mayo Clinic. This is how we use class hierarchy to classify samples into never before seen classes in biomedicine. First, we cannot better apply zero shot learning in biomedicine using class embeddings generated from class hierarchies. For biologists, they can now make prediction tasks with no training samples, such as new drug, new genes, new diseases. Computer scientists, they can use the embedding from 227 hierarchies to investigate new zero-shot learning method, new zero-shot learning tasks in biomedicine. We have just finished talking about the first two parts. Now we can classify samples into never before seen classes. The next question is, how can we interpret these predictions? So how to interpret the prediction of a never before seen class? Many existing methods and the interpretable features, many existing methods find interpretable features within this data set. For example, glioblastoma is one of the most aggressive cancer with average survival time of only three months. From this glioblastoma patient cohort, we found that we can find that which genes are interpretable for cancer survival. And we may find out that these seven genes are interpretable. But is this information enough? This is information is very helpful but we might want to know a little bit more. That is, why these genes are interpretable? Can we interpret these interpretations? This kind of why question is actually the key question in science. They are the new knowledge scientists want to know, especially when interpreting something we have never seen before. So how should we answer this question? Well, let's look at this character string. These characters can interpret my talk, and they are the most representative information of my talk. But can you understand this string? You may not even know how to read this string. Why? Because the structural information is missing here. There's no space, no punctuation. In biology, it is the same. Even if we found out that these seven genes are interpret interpretable, we still don't know why they cause glioblastoma. In fact, many biologists spend their whole life just studying one single gene. So it is very challenging for anyone to know why these seven genes cause glioblastoma. To understand the character string, we need to know the structure at different levels, like word, clause, sentence, paragraph. We cannot understand a document by only reading a character string. In biology, it is the same. To understand why these genes are interpretable in diseases, we need to know the information between gene and diseases. And in biology, we call them scales. Our biomedical world transmits from nanometer scale genes to micrometer scale cells to millimeter scale tissues, and finally, to the disease 
we observe a centimeter scale organism. Now the challenge is that we only observe gene scale information and disease scale information. How can we identify the scales between them? It is like you are reading a book now, and this book is only written in characters without any space, or without any space and any punctuation. How could you understand this book? Going back to this example, some of you might be able to understand this character string without any punctuation or any space. It is actually the title of my talk, Learning for Never Before Seen Biomedicine. In fact, if you can understand this sentence without space and the punctuation, you are using the multi skill knowledge graph in your brain. You infer that learning should be a word, never before seen should be a high level phrases. It's a combined phrase, a high level structure. And this whole string should be a sentence. The same in biology, we need such external knowledge graph to help us group these genes into gene modules, cells, and tissues. But we don't have such multi skill knowledge graph in biomedicine. Our contribution is to build the first ever multi skill knowledge graph in biomedicine. It integrates millions of scientific papers and biomedical database records. There are many other knowledge graphs. The main novelty of our knowledge graph is the multi skill structure. We have a very unique node type called multi skill gene modules. Each gene module is a set of genes that work together in the biological system. And these multi skill gene modules connect gene to diseases at multi skill. We found 27,000 novel gene modules from literature, so our knowledge graph can be updated all the time with new literature. By using this knowledge graph, we can now understand why these genes are interpretable. Let's review this example of glioblastoma. Here, an interpretable model tells you that these seven genes are interpretable, but you don't know why they are interpretable. We can answer this question by searching these seven genes and glioblastoma in our knowledge graph, and then extract a subgraph. We can then know that, for example, PCSK2 is important because it inhibits EGFR signaling pathway and then cause glioblastoma. Each edge here is linked to an external evidence. It could either be a database record or a scientific paper abstract which mentioned the two nodes sharing this edge. We evaluated the performance of using our knowledge graph on seven different prediction tasks such as predicting function given a set of genes or predicting the associated genes for disease. We found that integrating biological database and the scientific literature can do much better on these seven tasks than only using scientific literature. For example, in gene function prediction tasks, our method obtained 50 percentage improvement. One important principle in my research is to build web servers not just GitHub repo, so that people who has no programming experience can easily access our method and the data set. So I call myself full stack biological computer scientist. We have a web server for this project as well. User can, user can query any number of genes, drugs, gene modules, diseases. And we will then return a multi skill evidence subgraph for user and provide evidence from either literature or biological databases. Our method has also been used by hundreds of scientists in NIH NCAT Center. We are currently incorporating this system into NBAC system, so our method and knowledge graph will be used by more people in the future. We have also done some, done some other works in tax mining to support information extraction from noisy tax. For example, in this online health forum post, post this user mentions multiple drug side effects from different drugs. So side effects from different drugs are mixed together. Even this user doesn't know which side effect come from which drug. How can we figure out? We use a probabilistic topic model to model lots of text data jointly. And we then optimize this model using EM algorithm to find which side effect 
is associated with which drug. Our method has been used by doctors to analyze 300,000 patient records from six hospitals. So this is the last part of my talk. I introduced how a multi-skill knowledge graph can help us better understand biological discovery. For biologists, they can now obtain up-to-date and multi-skill evidence to interpret their discovery. For computer scientists, we provide a new multi-skill knowledge graph data set for mechanism identification in biomedicine. Well, let's summarize my talk and my previous research. Using our representation method, we can now provide personalized cancer treatment for 6,000 patients. Our method has been used by Mayo Clinic and NIH Knowing Center to identify drug mechanisms. These methods are recognized by Amy and Yein Review Award and a few other Dream Challenges Award. We also introduced a new biomedical data set for machine learning researchers to study zero-shot learning in biomedicine. In the classification part, we talk about two important problems, protein function prediction and cell type prediction. Our method has been used, in, has been used by Chen Suckberg Biohub to predict cell types in one of the largest data sets in the world. We successfully accelerate their pipeline from three months to 20 minutes. And we are currently apply, applying our method to rare disease detection for California newborn screen program. In the interpretation part, we introduced the first ever multi-skill knowledge graph. Our knowledge graph has been used by 200 scientists in NIH NCATS. And another text mining method has been used, used by doctors to analyze electronic medical records of 300,000 patients from six hospitals. These three steps together, representation, classification, and the interpretation, build up a comprehensive framework and let us study biomedicine from no labels to new knowledge. And the most exciting thing is that it is a general computational solution to many different biomedical problems like cancer survival analysis, single cell prediction, protein function prediction, drug side effect prediction, and electronic medical record analysis. Next, I'm going to talk about some future works, future computational biology problems in representation, classification, and interpretation. Then I'm going to talk about future works in more broad computer science areas. The first problem is how we can do high order zero shot learning. High order prediction means predicting the effect of combinations. For example, predicting synergistic effect of drug combination in cancer treatment. This problem could be more challenging if we only have training data for low order single drug and we don't have any training data for high order combination like two drugs. So it is a high order zero shot learning. I think a key solution to this problem is how to represent key items jointly, how to represent one drug, two drugs, three drugs, so that they are comparable in the low dimensional space. The second important future work is to do transfer learning across populations. So most of our biological data sets are collected from certain populations. For example, UK Biobank is the most widely, is the most widely used and loved by combined people like us. However, more than 19% of patients are Europeans. So machine learning model trained on this data set cannot be generalized well to other ethnic groups. How can we develop effective transfer learning algorithm so that we can generalize our machine learning model to understudy populations? The third future direction is a more broad one. Can we better use NLP in biomedicine? Right now, NLP in biology mostly focuses on analyzing text data in biomedicine, like scientific papers or clinical notes. But I think it will be more exciting to directly integrate biological data into the NLP model. So one interesting example would be, how can we automatically generate analogy from common sense? By aligning biotext data and other text data, can we infer that if human is like a city, 
if single cell is like a building, then protein is like a bricks or carpets or windows. Many other CS areas are also are very important in never before seen biomedicine. So to elaborate some of them, I would like to use data collection as an example. There are a few challenges, there are a few challenges in biomedical data collection. I summarize them as how to generate data, how to collect data, and how to share the data. So to generate data in biomedicine, we need to free bench scientists from tedious lab work. Especially at this COVID-19 time, they cannot do anything without going to the lab. Can we build robots for them? Or can we use computational design to help them work more efficiently? To collect data, we need to encourage people to participate in tests. Maybe they fear negative results. They may even lie to doctor about some very sensitive information, whether they are smoking or drinking alcohol. So how can we use HCI and ubiquitous computing to encourage them participate in tests and support them. Finally, to share the data, we need to have secured method and scalable database approaches to support data sharing in biomedical. Thank you. This is all I want to talk today, how to represent, classify, and interpret never before seen biomedicine. And by doing these three steps, we build a general computational approach to different biomedical problems. And this solution enables us to transfer from no labels to new knowledge. Finally, I would like to thank all of my collaborators. I'm also looking for more computer science collaborators to help me, help us, help every patient help every human being advance biomedicine. Thank you, and I'm happy to take questions. Okay, <laughs> I can see, <laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah. All right, so, um, yeah, so thank you for the great talk. I really like your talk. I have uh, many questions, but I wanna see what other people have uh, in mind. I know that Magda was going to ask a question during the talk, it was somehow missed. Magda, you wanna, let's start with yours. Uh, yeah, thank you. So, yeah, thank you for the great talk. This is really interesting uh, work. Uh, I, I was, I just had a clarifying question for uh, the first part of the talk. Uh, so, the most important component of that uh, first part is that you need to have a hierarchy in ontology. Um, but it seems like there's an assumption that in order to get good results, that uh, ontology, that uh, hierarchy, has to be sufficiently detailed. Yeah. Right. So what, how, like how detailed is sufficiently detailed or how do you know that the, you know, it's a good enough hierarchy. And also there seems to be an assumption that there's an expert or someone who knows how to match the new entities somehow into that hierarchy. So how do you make sure that this can be done? So that's my two part question. Uh, so the first question is uh, the hierarchy need to, need to be very detailed, right? The second question is how to uh, make sure the expert how to, what's the second question? Can you say that again? What's the second yeah, so question? how do you know kind of if you have a new, let's say new kind of disease okay, how to add it. coronavirus that you can actually match it correctly, map it in the right place in the hierarchy? Yeah. So first of all, I think this, I think first of all, I, so first of all, whether we need very detailed hierarchy depends on whether we need very detailed prediction. If we want to predict, if we, so those kind of hierarchy, they have this kind of from general to specific structure. If we just say we want to predict this patient that coronavirus, then we don't need very detailed hierarchies. Just stop here. And then later, when human or some experts, we want to classify coronavirus into alpha coronavirus and the beta coronavirus, they, class it, they split into different categories, then our machine learning model can also further learn whether this specific coronavirus patient should belong to alpha or beta coronavirus. So machine learning model can be updated with this hierarchy. And if, if the expert just stop here with no, with no deeper layer here, we also cannot uh, predict for the, for the remaining, for the beta coronavirus and alpha coronavirus. Yeah, this is the, the answer for the first question. If we really want to do that, we can use some text, text mining method to expand the hierarchy. So for the second question, how to add the, how to add the node to this hierarchy? Actually, this does not require a very strong expertise. I think some, maybe some very simple guess or some very simple prior knowledge can be used here. We don't expect this hierarchy to be perfect. 
actually this hierarchy is often very noisy. And that's why we need to do embedding here. So for example, coronavirus, maybe the expert will just add the coronavirus, add the COVID-19 here. I think this is very easy to do. And then if there's some mistake, if it's not incorrect, COVID-19 shall be added to alpha coronavirus. We can use data, use our machine learning model to correct it. So I think it will be a synergistic effect or it will be a combination, combination source from expertise, human knowledge, and the data. So I think they will help us synergistically uh, address this question. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, next is Georg. Yeah, very, uh, very impressive work, very nice talk. Um, I had a question about the single cell um, analysis, and I was just curious there. So in your example, where you say you train on about 100 cell types, and then you essentially annotate you know, 2,000 or so clusters, is the output of your annotation the actual name of a you know, putative cell type based on the ontology? And is this primarily based on similarity of gene expression patterns between something you've seen and something you've not seen yet? Or? Yeah, it's, it's primarily based on gene expression pattern. For example, here in this example, let's say we see cell type B, cell type of D, B, D here. We don't see A, C, E here. Then we can still predict a cell to cell type E. If that cell type, we, we can still classify a cell into cell type E. If that cell is very similar to cells, it's, if that cell's expression is similar to cells in cell type B, but this similar, not similar to cell type B. So we still use gene expression too as a, as a feature to measure similarity. So we, if we know B, D, we want to predict E, we will say if something is similar to B, but not similar to D, it shall be here because E is closer to B, but more far away from D. This is based on G expression. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I have a question. So maybe, you know, more like a um, suggestion. So, uh, you know, as we know, the single cell type prediction problem is currently the most important problem in biology. So something like, you know, deep learning in AI. Um, yeah. yeah, so, uh, and then, well, I can see Georg seems to agree with that. So, so as a future direction, I would you know, combine the interpretation approach you presented in the third part of the talk um, with the classification method you present in the second part so that you can use both of gene expression data and this knowledge graph so that you can better you know, predict the cell type. Is that something, have you thought about that? Yes, I think that's true, we can do that. So what we are doing, I think, I think we can do it in I think well, I see we can do it in both ways, right? First, we can use knowledge graph, trying to find some, for example, knowledge graph from the literature. Literature tell us cell type E is related to gene A, G, is related to gene one, gene two, but we have never seen cell type E in our data set. Then we can use those knowledge graph information as a feature markers to help us classify cells in cell type E. So we can use knowledge graph to tell us those kind of never be seen cell types, which genes are related to that. This is from one direction. And I think we can also do it for, for the other direction. That is, if our model tells us that, so actually we did that in our paper. After we train our model, we can find the gene markers for every cell type here. And then we can use them to, supplement, to supplement human knowledge. So people later, they can use, so this will be from model to human knowledge. When we know some new markers for those genes, people later can use them to do a classification. They don't even need to run our model. So factually this result, so this result is what we did. We found some gene markers for cell types we had never seen before, and the human used those genes to classify cells. They didn't even run our model. They, did, they didn't even need to do super learning or run our model. They just based on, we tell them that this gene is overexpressed. It will be cell types, it will be this cell type. We tell them this information, they do the classification. So I think it's a bi-direction problem. Not only use knowledge graph to update the model, but our model will also generate lots of knowledge for humans. Thank you. Any more questions from the audience? I have a question about the single cell part. Uh, we'll show the, the cell hierarchy. Uh, so uh, if, if, you, if the seeing data include cell type B, D, and E, is it still possible to predict an unseen data type 
uh, cell type as you know cell type C or others that you 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 don't have at all. Like it's not even on the same branch of the hierarchy. Is that possible? Yeah, that would be very difficult. So for for example, let me say in this way: if we know A, B, C, right? If we see A, B, C, but we have never seen D and E, then our method cannot distinguish from D and E because they are in the identical uh, topological situation in this hierarchy. If we know A, B, C, we we cannot distinguish D, E. Going back to your question, if we know B, D, E, we can somehow still guess whether it's A or C because A is pretty close to B, D, E. A C is very far away from BDE. If in our low dimensional embedding, for example, here, we have uh, BDE, we have BDE here. Maybe C, A is quite close to them, although we haven't, known, we haven't seen it. And C is very far away. So we can still somehow try to classify them. But again, it also depends on the distribution of cell types on the cell, cell, cell type hierarchy. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, I don't see any more hand or questions in the chat. Are you sure? <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. Thank you for Thank you. the talk. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you everyone. Thank you everyone.